So we're here today for the Innovation Spotlight, shining a light on bold ideas in wound care. One of the wonderful things about this is we would not be where we are today were it not for our friends who have the people who bring us updated and new technologies and services to enhance the opportunities to either prevent or close wounds. So our industry partners, they're truly industry partners. They're not just people that sell stuff to us. They are people who partner with us to get the outcomes that we need. And that's why we're here today to look at or review either new or program, uh, program, excuse me, uh, processes that have been in place for a while or technologies that might have some updates. Our next presentation for Moleculite will be given by Martha Kelso. Martha is the founder and chief executive officer for Wound Care Plus LLC. She oversees the operations of her wound care practice and is a highly sought after speaker, educating nationally on the art and science of wound healing. She has published extensively regarding the national standards and trends for wound care in the healthcare industry. As an innovator, Ms. Kelso became a principal investigator for clinical research that studies excuse me, clinical research studies that focus on FDA-approved products. As a legal expert for wound cases, Ms. Kelso offers her knowledge and training in the defense of healthcare entities. Please welcome Martha Kelso. That was so nice. How exciting. Let's see. Uh, so I am not a paid speaker for Moleculite. I am not, I, as a statement of disclosures, I'm not paid by Moleculite to be here. I'm here because of the technology and the research studies that we published in the long-term care sector. Can you hear me? I'm a little bit taller than the other panelists, I think. Okay. <laughs> so I want to talk about detecting bacterial burden in wounds and the challenge. We know that clinical signs and symptoms are not accurate in wound care approximately 50 to 85 percent of the time based on the research that's been published. We also know that the knowledge of bacterial burden at the point of care supports proactive wound care. Obviously we can't heal wounds if they're infected or they have high bacterial loads. Point of care fluorescence is what I like to call trunk to bed technology. Because it is portable, it's handheld, and it's non-invasive, for mobile people like myself, it's not a 40-pound piece of equipment that my advanced wound specialists have to lug in and out of their trunk, and I don't have to worry about taking it in and out of rooms because it's easily disinfectable. So that red or cyan, where the white arrows are, when that device fluoresces, we know that there is uh, elevated bacterial burden at at least 10 to the fourth power or beyond. We see that there's exponential growth of the evidence that supports the use of moleculite. We're not talking small studies. They have over 60 publications, and there's new studies that are going to be 2,000 plus and beyond. Personally, I'm in the middle now of an 800 wound study in long-term care. We just published our 193 wound study, and I presented that to Medicare about two to three weeks ago, presented their our data on their insureds back to them in the long-term care sector. And I can tell you they were blown away by the research study that we published, and now we're moving on to an 800 wound study. So the outcomes and the data speaks for themselves. Let's talk about my outcomes. What I did was we did a retrospective analysis. So at the time that we adopted Moleculite in the long-term care or post-acute sector, we had no intent of doing research. We just believed the device worked, we wanted access, more tools in our toolbox, and we wanted something that could help us point to what we should do versus guessing. And so we implemented these devices. We did not have them in 2019 and 2020. So that makes it really easy to have a nice clear point in time to start gathering research. We know we implemented them in 2021 and 2022. So what we did was then once we had this data in our database, we decided, wonder if the device is working. Is it changing our treatment plans? How is this benefiting the elderly? So we did a retrospective analysis. Um, that retrospective analysis was 193 wounds treated by 17 clinicians. So um, you think about standard of care, but standard of practice. 
Not all 17 clinicians practice the same. They don't think the same. They don't have the same experience, the same assessment skills, the same experience. And so even looking at this clinical research is somewhat fascinating considering all the potential variables that could exist, let alone different nursing homes, different bedside nurses, right? We also looked at diabetic foot ulcers and pressure injuries. Um, so the percent of wound healing at 12 weeks was 20.2% in our standard of care. These are the sickest of the sick. You know, you think about one ICD-10 diagnosis code in the long-term care sector, they might have 20, minimally, sometimes 60. These people also have eight to nine to 10 pages of medication lists, lots of polypharmacy. And so that 20.2% heal rate at 12 weeks prior to implementing moleculite and the average duration of healing was 17.6. Implementing post-moleculite, those rates went up to 36.5% healed at the 12-week mark and we reduced our heal rates down to 12.9 weeks. A lot of our elderly, about 60% of wounds, have mixed etiology. So pressure may be the primary etiology, but they may also have a diabetic, arterial, or venous component in addition. Um, these are the two arms where you can clearly see that the standard of care never did catch up to the heal rates utilized by moleculite. Um, the outcomes then, what about antibiotics? What happened with that? Did we prescribe more? Did we prescribe less? So you can see prior to the implementation of moleculite, which is somewhat in the middle of the pandemic, we were prescribing antibiotics about 48.1% of the time, and not topical antibiotics either, systemic. Systemic antibiotics are so caustic to our elderly, everything from liver impairment to C. diff to confusion that leads to falls and fractures. It's one of the worst things we can do if we don't absolutely have to, and we don't even talk about multidrug resistant organisms in that mix. And the percent of patients with severe wound complications at that point was 17.3%. That means we're sending them to the hospital, we're sending them with sepsis, they have amputations and gangrene 17.3% of the time. Post-moleculite implementation, we reduced antibiotic usage, systemic prescriptions by 25%, and we reduced significant wound complications in the sickest of the sick the most underserved and the nation's retired poor by 53% of the time. So what were the treatment plan changes? Did our providers, our advanced wound specialists feel like their treatment plans changed? The answer is hell yes. Can you say that on a Sunday morning in <laughs> Vegas? Anyway, the earlier interventions, so you can see the top left wound, it doesn't look great, but it looks like something I need to debreed. It doesn't look like something that's clinically infected. We don't see redness around the tissue. It doesn't look like it has an abscess formation or erythema. And yet, under fluorescence, we actually find a hidden abscess and sinus tract formation that we could not see with the naked eye. So that bottom left photo, you can literally see the sinus tract taking off at about the 9 o'clock of the wound, 10 o'clock of the wound. Also, monitoring treatment effectiveness was appropriate. And so once they removed that abscess and did debride, the two weeks later, they're thinking, that doesn't look too bad. I mean, it's smaller and it's healing and maybe there's a callus. They fluoresce again and we actually find more hidden um, elevated areas of bacterial burden in that peri wound. So the provider did go ahead and debride again and unroofed another area of abscess that was lying in the peri wound sector. So we were able to do better planning and also better wound hygiene and debridement. Additionally, the bedside nurses at the nursing home had the confidence to know when we walked out of that room that that person did not have high levels of bacterial burden, meaning they were not sending them to the ER 24 to 48 hours after our visit because they thought the wound might be infected. It actually encouraged compliance from the bedside nurses. Okay. And then this is better debridement and better hygiene under the video um, section of uh, moleculite. You can actually video and see if you're getting good treatment, good cleaning, and good debridement. Real-time feedback. So long-term care and SNFs, we know that they're particularly vulnerable. We know that they have a blunted immune response in the aged or elderly. As a matter of fact, about only about 50% of elderly have an actual fever when they arrive at the ER with true sepsis. 
So oftentimes, um, they have true infection, true sepsis, true systemic responses, but it doesn't show. They just kind of, I don't feel good today. Well, is that because they're depressed? Is that because they're not eating? Is it because they're getting older? Or is it because they're septic? You know, you be the guessing judge. Nobody really knows. And yet, paradoxically, this is the sickest of the sick, but we are the last guys to get the implementation of the new procedures, the new <laughs> healing modalities, the new fancy equipment that helps us diagnose at the bedside. And then they also forget to give us the magic wand to heal the wounds in absence of those technologies. So, great, great benefit.